I did it. I finally fucking did it. I did a video of how to play StarCraft the board game. Let me show you how. Hi players, bonjour from Paris, my name is Asaf Hirsch and welcome to my channel Easy Board Games. Today I'm going to show how to play StarCraft the board game. As always, if you learned something new or if you saw something that you like, please consider subscribing to my channel and help me grow this amazing community. Like and comment on the video and tell me which kind of game would you like to see on this channel. Ready to take over the galaxy? Let's go to setup. Alright guys, so the first thing that we'll need to do is that each player will choose one of the six different factions that we have in this game. We have two different factions for each one of the three races. As you can see, this is going to be a three player game where the first player, Mr. Cactus, is playing one of the Terrans factions, the red color. Mr. Schwett over here will play the Zerg of the purple color. And we have me playing as Tassadar, the Prutos yellow player. Then we'll need to take all the different kind of tokens. So we have here a little bit in a mess, but we have here some building uh, tokens. We have the base tokens, the worker tokens, the different module tokens, and some carrier tokens. Then we'll take the different combat cards and technology cards. So as you can see over here, a combat card will be something like this, and a technology card will be with this symbol at the bottom of the card. We're going to separate them into two different decks, where here we're going to have the technology cards and here we're going to have the shuffled combat cards. And we will draw from the combat deck six cards, unless you're playing the Terran, which in this case you will draw eight cards. Then we're going to place the conquest point track and on number zero we're going to put a token from each faction. Then we're going to prepare the event deck. So we'll take all stage three event cards. We're going to take all the cards from stage one stage two, and we're going to shuffle separately each of them. All the event cards from stage three will go to the bottom of the event deck. And then we're going to take out cards from stage two and stage one, depends on how many players we have. So since this is a three player game, we're going to take out 15 cards from each stage. After that, we're going to put the stage two on top of stage three and stage one on top of stage two. After that, we're going to put all the deplate tokens next to the plank area. And now it's time to start preparing the galaxy. In order to do that, first of all, we'll need to choose who will be the first player. Randomly, of course. So randomly, I have chosen that Mr. Schwett over here will be the first player. After that, we'll take all the planet tokens that we have over here. We'll give them a good shuffle, as usual, the best shuffle in YouTube. And we're going to give to each player two of these tokens. All the unused planet tokens we can put back in the box. Then the first player will look at his two planet tokens and he will choose one of them to place in the middle of the table. That will create actually our board. So let's put these tokens right over here so we can see more clearly. So Mr. Shirt will be able to choose if he wants to place first Abaddon or he will prefer to put Halcyon or Halcyon. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Mr. Schwed decided that he wants Halcyon to be the first planet on the table. And he, of course, can orientate it in any way that he would like. Now he needs to choose if he would like to put his base on this planet or not. Knowing, of course, that if he chooses not to put his base on this planet, he will have to put it on the next one. Mr. Schwed decides that he does want to put a base on this planet because it has some nice resources. So he will take this token that we have right over here and we'll put it in one of the areas on the planet itself. Then going clockwise, the next player who is Tassadar will choose which one of these two planets he would like to put on the table. Tassadar decides that Helios will be the first planet that he will put on the table and again he can orient it in whichever way that he would like to as long as it can connect to the first planet that already uh, was put on the table by Mr. Schwett. So he will decide to connect it just like this. Pay attention that these two planets are now adjacent and the part that is connecting them is something that is called a normal navigation route. I, who is playing Tassadar, will also decide to put my uh, first base on this planet. Arcturus Manx, played by Mr. Cactus, now need to decide which planet he would like to put on the table. Of course, he will be able to put it adjacent to either one of the planets. So it will be adjacent either to the Zerg planet right here, 
or to the pruner's planet right next to it. Mr. Cactus decides to put pride water just like this. But he will decide that he does not want to put his first base on this planet. Now that we have finished placing all the planets, we're going to have another round of placing planets, but this time the last player is going to start and going counterclockwise. So Mr. Cactus decides that he will put Antigua Prime like this. And now pay attention that the red player has absolutely no choice but to put his base on the last planet that he's put. The yellow player will put his second planet like this. And here I would like to show you that because we have these two planets right next to each other and we have the possibility to put the normal navigation route between them, we will have to put and connect between them. And the purple player, the Zerg, will decide to put their last planet like this. The next thing that we'll do is that each player will take two of these matching colored Z-axis navigation routes. And again, starting from the first player, he will choose to which edges, such as this or this, he would like to attach it to. And the function that it creates is basically that two planets that are connected with the same color of Z-axis navigation routes will now be uh, considered as adjacent. So for example, starting with the Zerg, they will put one Z-axis over here and one Z-axis right over there. Going clockwise, the yellow player will do this. As you can see, on this current board, we have only one planet that still has this way of inserting this Z-axis navigation route. And since it means that we cannot match it with a second one of the same color, the last player will not be able to put these two Z-axis navigation routes, and that means that he will not get to put it at all, and we can put it back in the box. Now, as we can see, on the different planets, we have different resources. So we'll need to take all the resource cards that we have over here with the names of the planets that we have in this game, and then we will have to distribute all the resource cards to the corresponding players that have base on that specific planet. For example, on Antigua Prime, we can see that we have two resources, the Vesping Gas and the Minerals. So we will take these two cards with the name of Antigua Prime on them, and we will give them to the red player. The red player will put it in his blank area just like this. Pay attention that we're putting these cards facing this side up and not on the other side that is the depleted side that is marked by this X that you can see on the top left corner. Let's do that with all the other players. The next thing that we'll do is to put the starting forces. So as you can see right over here, behind every player mat, we're going to have a list of these starting forces. In the case of Tessador over here, He's going to have a starting force of three zealots, eight workers that we're going to put in the worker pool right over here, and one transport. In case of Mr. Schwetz Zerg, we're going to have three zerglings, two hydralisks, seven workers that are already in the worker pool, and one transport. The red player will start with two marine units, one fire bat, one ghost, eight workers, and again one transport. Now each faction will be able to put their starting forces on their, let's say, home planet. That means the planet that they currently have with their base on it. Pay attention that on different planets we have different amount of areas. For example, on Abaddon over here we have two areas, while on Tarsonis over here we have three areas. On each area we can see these circles that actually indicates how many units maximum can we have on this specific area. This will change a little bit when we're going to have a combat, but this is something that we'll talk about a little bit further down the video. So the Zerg right now will need to decide how they would like to distribute their starting forces between these three areas. So Mr. Schott will decide to do this. Two Hydralisks in this area and three Zerglings in this one. Now the Zerg will have to choose where they will put their transporter. Now we'll talk about it a little bit later when we'll talk about movement, but in general, this transporter is what allows us to move between the different planets. So the Zerg will put their transporter right over here. Going clockwise, let's do it quickly for all the other players. The first phase is the planning phase. Here, players will take turns in order to put this 
order tokens that are research, build, and mobilize on the different planets. The second phase is the execution phase, where players will take turn executing all the order tokens on the different planets. The third phase is the regrouping phase, which will have a sequence of things we'll need to do, and this is pretty much some sort of a reset uh, to the whole gaming area and some of the units. To win in StarCraft, we have a few possibilities. The first one is the normal winning condition, which means the first player that reaches 15 conquest points. The second possibility for winning is the special victory condition that we can find in each faction map right over here. I will not go over all of them right now, but just here in this case of Aldaris, I want to make a clarification. When we have a player that chose the Aldaris faction, the special victory condition is that all the other factions will need to have 20 conquest points and not 15 in order to win, but Aldaris itself will need to obtain only 15 conquest points in order to win. The third option is that if we have an endgame victory, and that means if we have in the common playing area, two of these cards that are called the end draws near. These cards come from the event deck, but we'll talk about them a little bit later. The fourth victory option is if we have a player elimination. And that means if on all of the galaxy we have only one player left. And that means that all the other players have been eliminated. In the planning phase, the factions will take turns starting from the first player going clockwise to put these different order tokens on the different planets. Each faction will put four order tokens. We will go over the order tokens in just a few more minutes, so let's just see how it will go in the first planning phase. It's also important to say that the faction will be able to play an order token only if they have a unit on that specific planet, or if it is an adjacent planet. And that means that if, for example, the Zerg will decide to take this order token and put it somewhere on the board, they will be able right now to put it either on this planet or on this planet right over here. They will not be able to put it on all the other planets. Here I'm just reminding you that we have the Z-axis navigation route, and that means that the Protoss, for example, will be able to put their order token on this planet, this one, this one, or even this one. And that's because they have the Z-axis navigation route between this planet and this one, which makes them adjacent. Order tokens are being placed on these places on the different planets. Pay attention that for each order token we have two kind of colors, the silver-like and the gold-like. For now, let's ignore the gold-like because we will talk about it when we'll talk about modules. So we will put right now on the planets only the silver-like order token. So the first order token that the first player, the Zerg, are going to put is this one right over here. Then we will have the Prutos putting their first order token right over here. And the Terran will put their order token on Pride Water. Just in case it was not clear, of course putting the order tokens is something that's supposed to be a secret. And that means that all the other players are not aware of which order token you have put on the planet. Once an order planet has been put on a planet, no player will be able to review that order token. The only thing that we'll be able to do, and we'll see it once we have some order tokens that are stacked on each other, is to see what exactly is the order of the tokens. But again, they will not be able to flip it and review it, even if it's your order token. The second order token of the Zerg will be placed over here. So we can already see that we're starting to stack order tokens. And when we'll go to the execution phase, we'll see how it goes exactly. The Prutos second order token will come right over here. Terran's second order token will come here. Zerg third order token will come here. Protus third order token. Terran number three will come over here. Zerg number four will come here. Protoss number four will come here. And Terran number four will go on Antigua Prime. That concludes the planning phase. Moving on to the execution phase. In the execution phase, players will take turns starting from the first player and going clockwise in resolving the order tokens that they have put. Players can resolve an order token only if they have an order token that is visible. If a certain player still has order tokens somewhere on the planets, 
but it is not visible. It means that there are some other players order tokens that are stacked on top of it. They will draw an event card. So let's just take an example, but let's say that the situation is like this. Right now we can see that the Zerg will need to execute their first order, but none of them is visible. That means that other players order tokens are stacked on top of them. This means that the Zerg has obstructed orders. And that means that the Zerg will draw one event card from the top of the deck and they will put it in their playing area without looking at it. So let's just take this and put it right over here. This card will be resolved in the regrouping phase. In this phase, if a player needs to execute an order token, he can instead of that take this token back to his possession and draw one event card. He will place this event card in his playing area without looking at it. Going back to our actual game, the Zerg see that they have two possibilities to resolve their order tokens. So they have a choice if they want to resolve this one first or this one. The Zerg decide to resolve this order token first. So they will just flip it so all the other players can see what is their action and they will resolve it. This is a building order token. With a build order, players will be able to build new workers, transports, and units. Players will also be able to purchase a base, a building for their bases, and or purchase one module for their bases. So when we execute this build order, we need to follow a certain sequence. So first of all, if the active player, and that means the player that are now executing the order, has a base on the active planet, he will be able to build any number of workers and transports and also build any number of units equal to his unit build limit. First of all, an active planet means the planet that we're executing the order on it. Let's start with the building new workers. So as you can see over here, to build one worker or one transport for this matter, cost one mineral. When we need to pay with resources, we will take one or more workers from the worker pool and we will put it in one of the following locations. The first location is over here. These are the resources that are printed on the player mat. These resources will always be at our disposal and they're not attached to any planet. We will always be able to use these resources unless we're going to deplete them, but we'll talk about them a little bit later. The other possibility is to put it in one of the cards that we have from the planet's resources cards. So if I would like to build, for example, two workers and one transport, I will take three workers and I will put them in any one of the places that I can harvest resources. So I can put, for example, three workers over here or two on this card and one on the player mat. But what is important is that we'll place the workers that we have on them. So for example, I can put one worker over here and two workers on the player mat. Now that we have three minerals, we can take the two workers that we wanted to build and put it on the unavailable workers. So obviously we will not be able to use them at this round and we will bring them to the worker pool at some point in the regrouping phase. We'll be able to build a transporter if the player that is building it has a base on the active planet. Then we'll take the transporter and we will put it on a navigation route adjacent to the active planet. It can be a normal navigation route or a z-axis navigation route. So for example, let's say that this is the active planet that with it we have chosen to build a transport. We'll be able to put it in a few places. The first one is over here. The second one is over here. Here we can see, for example, that we already have a transporter and that is illegal and also will give us nothing to put a second transporter there. And the last option, since we see that this planet and this planet are adjacent, we'll be able to use this z-axis navigation route. But when we will put it, we will put it on the bigger part of the z-axis navigation route. So we'll be able to put it right over here. Still in this part of the sequence, we'll be able to build units up to our unit limit. At the beginning of the game, each faction has a unit build limit of two. This is something that we'll be able to upgrade later if we will build some different modules or if we'll talk about the Zerg, but we'll keep it for a little bit later. Right over here on the player mat, we can see that we have three different kind of buildings. The first one is already printed on the player mat and that means that we already have some units that are available to purchase. Later, when we'll upgrade buildings or construct new ones, we'll have more units that will be available. So let's say, for example, that Tassada has decided to build two zealots. So he will need to pay four minerals. So again, we'll take four workers 
and we're going to send them to harvest those minerals. And then we'll take from our supply two of these zealots and we're going to put them on the active planet. So if in our example we can see that this is the active planet of Tassadar, we have different areas to put these zealots on. As a reminder, each area has a unit limit. So in this place, for example, in this area, we will not be able to add more zealots. So we will need to choose another area. This can be one example. This can be a second example. And I think you already understood how it will work. The next part of this sequence is that if the active player has at least one friendly base or unit on the active planet, then he may upgrade his bases by purchasing one building and or one module, placing them on the player map. So basically in StarCraft, when they're talking about building modules or buildings, they're actually calling them upgrading your bases. So with one building order token, we'll be able to build one of these buildings and or add another module. Let's talk about building this type of buildings. So in this specific answer, we already know that we have this building that is printed and that means that we already have it. But we see the number one over here and that means that we'll be able to upgrade this building. So for example, let's say that we decided to build this building. In this case, we will need to pay one mineral. So again, we will take one worker and go harvest one mineral and then we'll be able to put this building right over here. Now we can see that on top of purchasing a zealot that we could have done earlier, now we can purchase a dragoon also. And at a later turn, we can already build even the third upgrade of this building, which will allow us to build a high Templar. Now let's talk about upgrading the bases with the modules. So in StarCraft, there are three types of modules. The first one is supply. The second one is research and development. And the third one is air support. The first one, the supply module, increases the owner's unit build limit. For each supply module that that player has built, his unit build limit will increase by one. So for example, if we have decided to upgrade with this module, first of all, it will cost us one mineral. After we have built it, we're going to put it right over here. And then it means that we'll be able to produce three units at a time. With the Zerg, we have a little bit of a different situation. So as you already paid attention, the Zerg don't have the supply module. Instead, their capacity of building units will be increased as more buildings they're going to build on their player mat. So for every unique building that they're going to have, they will be able to build twice that amount. The second module that we'll be able to upgrade is the research and development module. For each module of this type that we're going to have, we'll be able to put in the planning phase a special order token. We'll talk about what does a special order token do a little bit further down the video. So if, for example, Tassadar has decided to build one of these modules, it will cost two minerals that we will harvest with our workers. We'll put it right over here. And then in the next planning phase, he will be able to use one of the special order tokens. The last module that we'll be able to upgrade is called the air support module. This module grants a player's bases three important benefits. The first one is the cloaking detector, and that means that all of that player's units in the same area, pay attention in the same area, not in the same planet, as one of his bases gain the detector ability. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we'll talk about the cloak ability. The second benefit is the anti-aircraft defense. And when we will have a battle that occurs in an area containing one of the player's bases, the player receives plus one attack strength in each skirmish where the opposing frontline unit has a flying unit. And this is again something that we'll talk about when we'll talk about combat. The last benefit will be the limited orbital defense. And that means that opponents may not transport units across navigation routes from another planet directly into an area containing one of the player's bases. So if Tassadar has decided to build this module, he will pay three minerals and will put it again just like the other modules right over here. The last part of this sequence is that if the active player has at least one friendly unit on the active planet, but there are no existing base on that planet, he may build a new base on the planet. So let's say for example that we're looking at this planet. This is an active planet because we're going to execute the order token on it. And we can see that Tassadar has a friendly unit on this planet and there are no already existing bases. In this case, he will be able to pay two minerals and put a base on this active planet. Now, it's very important to follow this sequence so we will not do mistakes like 
first of all building a base, then upgrading it, and then units or something like that. So if, for example, we decided that we don't want to build new units, but we want to upgrade some of the buildings, once we have started upgrading, we cannot go back and purchase units. And that means that if, for example, I upgraded this building right over here in order to be able to build Dragoons, I will not be able in this build order to build a Dragoon. The next order token that I would like to show you is the Mobilize order. When we're using this token, we will first of all move the units and then resolve battles. During the move units part, we'll be able to do one or both of the following. First of all, we'll be able to move friendly units from one or more areas of the active planet to one or more areas on the active planet. So let's take planet Helios as an example. If Tassadar is performing the mobilize order on Helios, that means that Helios is the active planet. So he will be able to move the different units on this planet in any way that he would like, of course, not exceeding the unit limit in every area. This can be one example, or this can be another example. Also, we will be able to transport friendly units from one or more areas on the adjacent planets to one or more areas on the active planet. So let's see a few cases right now. Let's say that this is the situation and Tassadar would like to move the units from Tarsonis to Helios. While Helios is the active planet and we can move units over there, he doesn't have a transporter between the two planets on the normal navigation route. In this case, this order token will not serve anything, so either we will discard this token or the player will be able to do something else with the event deck that we'll talk about later. If Tassada would have had a transporter on this normal navigation route between these two planets, he would have been able to take the units from Tarsonis and move it to Helios. Pay attention that the other way around will not be possible because the active planet is Helios. Let's say that this is our example. Tassadar also would have been able to take all of the units from Tarsonis and spread them on different areas on Helios. Let's take another example. Let's say that Tassadar decides to move all of the units from Tarsonis in order to start a fight in Helios. So in the moving units phase, we'll be able to take all the units from Tarsonis and go to one of these areas on Helios. Here we have an exception with a unit limit on each one of the areas. The player who is attacking will be able to bring the same number of units as the unit limit plus two. So for example, where we have the two hydralisks, we'll be able to bring four units, right? Two plus two. And on the area that we have the ultralisk, we'll be able to bring up to six of the units, right? Four plus two. Pay attention that the order will always be first moving units and then resolve battles. That means that we're not able to create more than one combat in a mobilization order token. Let's take one last example. First of all, we can see that we have a transporter on a Z-axis navigation route right over here. When we have a transporter in this location, we need to take the second part, the smaller one, of the Z-axis navigation route and flip it to the other side. This is the warning side of the Z-axis navigation route. The moment that we will have a zero transporter on this part of the Z-axis navigation route, we can flip again this small token to the normal side of it. So right now, Tassadar is executing the mobilize order on Helios. So he will be able to take the units from Tarsonis and Antigua Prime and move all of them into Helios, just like that. The last order token that I would like to show you is the research order. First of all, in order to execute the research order, a player must have a base on the active planet. When we're executing the research order, we need to follow a small sequence. First of all, which is mandatory, we will draw an event card. So again, when we're drawing one of these cards, we don't look at it, we're just going to put it in our playing area and we will resolve it later at the regroup phase. The second step, which is optional, is to draw three combat cards into our hand. The third step, which is also optional, is to purchase a technology. When we want to purchase a technology, first we'll need to take all the technology deck, then we'll be able to research only one technology. Even if we can afford to research more technologies, we will be able to do it only one time per order token. So we can see that this technology is called increased carrier capacity. It's going to cost us one mineral. So again, we'll need to send one of our workers 
to harvest that mirror, and then we will take all the corresponding cards. And that means that if you can see on the bottom part of the card, we have three dots. And that means that on top of the card that you're seeing right now, there are two other copies. When we're researching a technology, we'll take all the copies of that technology and we'll put it in the combat deck. So after we have paid and we took all the corresponding cards, and again, I remind you, no need to pay for each one of these cards. It's enough to pay only one time, so one mineral in our case. We have all of the three copies and we're going to put all of them in the combat deck. After we've put the newly researched technology in the combat deck, we will need to shuffle our combat deck. And it's important to say that technology cards that are now going to be in the combat deck are now going to be used as combat cards. Usually in StarCraft the board game, combat is the most complicated part. So let's just take a series of examples to make sure that we understand everything. In this case, we can see that we have a mobilization order token right over here on Tarsonis. So the Prutos will move one Zealot from Helios to this area where we already have a fire bat of the Terran. When we have more than one unit of each faction in an area, this area will be considered as contested and we will immediately resolve the battle over there. So we're going to have a sequence of a few steps in order to resolve this. First of all, we'll take all the units and move them outside of the planet like this. Then we will put this mobilization token on the contested area. The second part is if we have some units with start of battle abilities, now will be the time to use it. Then if you remember, during setup, each player has drawn six combat cards from their combat deck to their hand, unless you're playing the Terran faction, and in this case you have eight combat cards. In this case, since it was the Prutos that used this mobilization order, they will be considered as the attackers, and the unit that was already in the contested area will be considered as the defender. In this case, the attacker, the Prutos, will be able to draw three more combat cards from their combat deck to their hand. The defender gets to draw one combat card and put it in their hand. Now the attacker needs to set all the different units in a series of skirmishes. Usually it will be one versus one, but sometimes we will have supporting units or assisting units, but this is something that we'll see later on. So if, for example, in the contested area, we would have had three units of the defender and the attacker would have moved three units in total, the attacker would need to set all the units in the most series of skirmishes as possible. In this case, it would have been one, one, and one. He will not be able to do, for example, two versus one, and then one versus one, leaving this unit behind. And basically it means that all the units will have to participate in the combat. The fifth step will be to assign supporting units. But again, this is something that we'll see with a later on example. Now we'll need to place the combat cards. So let's look at the anatomy of the combat cards. Here we can see a few things. First of all, we have different units that appear on the card. Also, we have some numbers at the top and a special ability. Now we're going to use the big numbers if one of the units on the card correspond to the frontline unit that we have on the battlefield. Both of these units are considered to be frontline units. Later, when we'll talk about supporting units, this is something that we'll need to keep in mind. So in this case, since we have a zealot on this card, and a zealot is our frontline unit that we have, that means that we'll be able to use the big numbers that we can see over here. And that means six damage and six health. Also, we'll have a special ability, but here it says, if your frontline unit is a dragoon, gain plus one attack versus a flying unit. Since our frontline unit is a zealot and not a dragoon, the special ability here will not take place. If the Protoss would have chosen to use this card, for example, we see that the unit that we have on this card is not the same unit that we have here at the front line. And that means in this case that we will use the small numbers that we can see. And that means five damage and six health and not nine damage and eight health. So the attacker will take this combat card and will put it just like this. This is considered to be a standard combat card. Continuing, the attacker will have the possibility to put something that is called a reinforcement card. And we can see that this is a reinforcement card with this sign that we have at the top of the card. Also, we can see that according to this icon over here, this is going to be for any unit. 
and the special ability that we can see is gain plus one health. If we would have chosen to put a reinforcement card that the unit again does not correspond with the unit at the front line, then when we will resolve the cards, this will not take part. So the Protoss decide that they want to play this reinforcement card also. After the attacker has finished, now it will be the time of the defender to put their combat cards. The defender decides to put this combat card right over here. So we again see that we have the fire bat on this card and that is indeed our front unit. And because of this, we will be able to use the big numbers and that means six damage and four health. It's important to say that if you have chosen to play two cards, the first one has to be a standard combat card. You will not be able to play only reinforcement card or two reinforcement cards. Another thing is that if the players are not happy with the cards that they have in their hands, they will be able to draw the top card from their combat deck and play it to the battlefield. But in this case, they will not be able to look at the card. They will just have to take it from the combat deck and put it immediately face down in the battlefield. Now we will start to resolve the skirmishes. Of course, here we have only one, so it will be a little bit easier. Step number seven will be to reveal the cards. And then we'll need to compare the attack and the health of both units. So in this specific case, we see that the damage that the Zealot is doing is six, which is greater than the health of the Fire Bat. And that means that the Fire Bat will be destroyed in this skirmish. But also at the same time, we can see that the attack that the Fire Bat has is the same as the health of the Zealot. And that means that the Zealot will also be destroyed. But we have to remember that we have the reinforcement card that says gain plus one health. And that means that the Zealot has seven health, which is greater than the damage of the Fire Bat. So in this specific skirmish, it would only be the Fire Bat that would be destroyed. If in another example, the Protoss would not use the reinforcement card, in this case, we can see that the Zealot has destroyed the Fire Bat but the same has happened on the other way. So both units would have been destroyed and this contested area would have stayed empty. But since this is not the case, what would happen is that the Zealot will stay the sole survivor on the contested area. And this order token, we can just bring back to the faction. Step number eight will be to resolve splash damage, but this is something again that we'll see in a different example. And in step number nine, we will resolve the retreats. Another option that we have is that units from both faction stayed alive after the whole battle. In this case, it means that the attack has failed and the attacker needs to retreat to an adjacent friendly zone. In this case, the Zealot will go back to one of the areas in Helios since we have a transporter in the normal navigation route. But if for some reason we would not have a transporter, in this case, the Zealot cannot retreat and will be destroyed. In another example, maybe we already have too many units in the legal places on Helios, and that means that there is no legal place for the Zealot to retreat. Also in this case, this Zealot would be destroyed. Let's go to the second example and see what are supporting units. In this example, we have the same attack but the Protoss will move two of their Zealots into the area with the Fire Bat. So as we already know, now immediately we'll start a combat and that means we'll put again this token over here and we'll take all the units off the board. So as we remember, the attacker needs to arrange all the units to have the most skirmishes as possible. We're going to have only one skirmish like this and the second Zealot will be actually a supporting unit. So just to make sure that we understand, this is going to be the frontline unit, while this is going to be the supporting unit. Again here, we're going to have the attacker draw the three combat cards and the defender one combat card. Then each side will decide to play one combat card. Now we will reveal the two combat cards. In this case, we can see that we have a fire bat on this card, and that is a frontline unit that we're having also. And that means that we'll be able to use the big numbers on the other side, we can see that again we have a Zealot, which is a frontliner, and it means that again we can use the big numbers 5 damage and 6 health. So when we look at the player sheet and we go to that specific unit, we can see this icon that says how much damage this supporting unit will add to the combat card. In the case of the Zealot, it's going to be 1. If we would have not had 
a supporting unit, then the fire bat would have won because five is smaller than six and six damage here equals to d6. And that means that the fire bat would have won. Since we do have a zero as a supporting unit, then now we can see that we're going to have five plus one, which equals six. And in this case, both frontline units will be destroyed, leaving one zealot as the winner in this skirmish. The rest of the steps are going to be exactly the same. In the next example, let's see what our assisting units are. So here we're going to have the Protoss moving two units, one zealot and one high templar. Now we remember that the attacker needs to have as many skirmishes as possible. So if we would have had two normal units, we would have had two skirmishes. But since the high templar is an assisting unit, it will be acting as a supporter unit immediately. It will not take part as an frontliner, but as a supporting unit. And since this is the situation, the attacker can decide which of the Terran units will be the frontliner. Obviously, the Protoss will decide to have the Marine as their frontliner. So now it's time to choose the combat cards. And we can see that for assisting units, all the combat cards will be a reinforcement card. So for the Protoss, we're going to have two of these cards right over here. And for the Terran, we're going to have only one combat card. So here we can see that the standard combat card has a Zealot with damage of 7 and 5, since the frontliner is a Zealot. And here on the other side, we can see that we have a Marine. And it means that since a Marine is the frontliner, we're going to have damage of 5 and health of 4. Now here we can see that the Fire Bat has a supporting power of 1, which means that the attack will be actually 6, right? 5 plus 1. So if we would not have this supporting unit, both of the units would have been destroyed. That means the Zealot and the Marine, not the Fire Bat. But here the assisting unit, the High Templar, kicks in. This card says, cancel your opponent's normal combat card. He must play a new one, either from his hand or from the top of the deck. So this card will be canceled. And since, let's say that in this example, the Terran doesn't have any more cards in their hand, they will have to draw a new card from the top of their deck. Unfortunately, on the new card, we don't have a Marine. And that means that we will have to use the small numbers. In case, it's going to be three damage and four health. And that means that the Marine is going to be destroyed. But even though the Protoss have won in this skirmish, or actually in this battle, they will still have to draw back to retreat because they did not manage to destroy all the defender units. It's important to say that assisting units like we just saw as the High Templar will never be able to be a frontliners unless all the units in one side or both of them are going to be assisting units. And in this case, one of them must be assigned as a frontliner. Let's take a similar example and see how we're going to resolve splash damage. So here we see that we have one river and one High Templar against one Marine and one Fire Bat. So let's say that we had the same procedure with the High Templar canceling the card. And again, the Marine didn't have cards, so they drew one from the top of their deck. So nine is bigger than four. And four, right, three plus one because of the supporting unit is not bigger than seven. So here again, we're going to have the Marine being destroyed. But here at step number eight in the combat, we're going to have resolve splash damage. And as we can see here on the combat card, it says, ground splash damage return to your technology deck after use so obviously when we will need to discard cards this one will go back to the technology deck and not to the discard pile but also we have this ground splash damage so first of all pay attention that it says ground because if we would have had air units it would have been a little bit different but we'll see it soon enough so splash damage is not something that is going to be resolved immediately during the skirmish, but only at a later step, as we saw at step number eight. So for every skirmish that we have the splash damage effect, after we have resolved all the skirmishes, and I remind you that here we're seeing only one, but later we'll see what happens when we have a few skirmishes, this splash damage is being triggered and we're going to put it aside and later we will resolve all the splash damage since it is accumulated. So in this skirmish, we saw that the Marine is dead. So we're going to put it back in the, uh, the supply of the Terran. And since we don't have any more skirmishes to do, now we will apply the splash damage. In this case, the affected player, which is the Terran, 
we'll have to choose one of the units that remained after all the skirmishes have finished and destroy it. Here we have only one fire bat, so he doesn't have much choices and he will need to destroy it. Pay attention that this card only says ground splash damage. So if we would have had a wraith as a supporting unit for the marine, it would not be affected by the splash damage because this is an air unit. Let's see a few examples about combination of ground and air units. So without again resolving combat cards, let's try to explain it. As we can see over here, we have two possibilities of damage. One is for ground units, and some units are able to damage both air and ground units. In this example, we can see that the zealots can only affect ground units, but the wraith can damage both air and land units. In this example, if we will play a reinforcement card for the wraith, in this case, both of these units can hurt the fire bat, and both of these units can hurt the zealot. So when we will resolve this skirmish, we're going to do exactly the same as we did so far. If for some reason the attacker decided that the wraith will be a frontliner, obviously the zealots cannot hurt the wraith because they can target only ground units. In this case, if the zealots have one in this skirmish, they will be able to destroy the fire bat that is actually the supporting unit. If we would have had, for example, a second supporting unit, then the defender would have been able to decide which unit he would destroy. In this kind of combat, for example, obviously the zealots cannot touch not the wraith and not the battle cruiser, and that means that it doesn't matter what they will play over here, they will not be able to hurt them. In another case, we can see that the Dragoon can do damage for land and air units, but in this case we would not be able to use the support force of the Zealot because the Zealot cannot target air units. So we would ignore this plus one that we can see right over here. I'll just remind again that if splash damage has been triggered, it has to trigger a unit that corresponds to what we have in the combat area. So if we're using in a combat a card that says ground splash damage, but both of the units of the opponent are air units, the splash damage will not take an effect. Let's see another example and discover what is cloaking. The attacker decided to put the units in this way, and here I want to show you a card that the Terran will use. As a reinforcement card, as we can see right over here, we can see that we have something that is called cloaking field. Now pay attention to this symbol over here, and this means that this will be triggered if the unit is either a frontliner or is a supporting unit, it doesn't matter. Here it says your Wraith and Ghost units in this skirmish gain cloaking. So here again we can see that 6 damage is bigger than 4 and 5 damage is smaller than 6. In this case the Ghost should have been destroyed, right? But thanks to the reinforcement card that the Terran have played, the Ghost will be able to use the cloaking ability. And that means that when a unit with a cloaking keyword is destroyed in a skirmish, it is not actually removed from the game board, but instead at the end of the destroy units and discard card step in the skirmish resolution, that unit will get to withdraws. And this means that the controlling player may immediately remove the unit from the battle and move it to a friendly or empty area on the active planet. Of course, again, if there is no such a legal area, that unit will be destroyed. In this case, the ghost will be able to move to another empty area like this, for example, or this one. Just to be clear, we need to remember that the cloaking ability only allows a unit to withdraw if it was supposed to be destroyed during the skirmish phase. And that means that this ability will not apply if that unit needs to be destroyed by a splash damage. So now let's look at one last example without really resolving it, just to make sure that we understand what to do. So again, we'll have the Protoist invading Tarsonis with the, all the forces that they have. So first of all, we need to put the Order token in the contested area. Then if we have a start of battle abilities, now will be the time. Then the attacker will draw three combat cards from their deck to their hand, and the defender will draw only one. Then we'll have the attacker establish the skirmishes. So here we see how bad was the movement of the Prutos because they're going to have one zealot against a fire bat, a river against a goliath, and another zealot against a wraith. After that we will assign the supporting units. So of course we have the assisting unit which is the high templar. And then after the attacker, the defender will apply his supporting units. So we'll have the battle cruiser 
supporting the Wraith. Then we'll have the attacker put all the combat cards for all the different skirmishes. And that means one standard combat card or two combat cards if we have the other one as a reinforcement combat card. And then we'll have the defender doing the same. Then we will resolve the skirmishes, which means that we're going to reveal the cards, compare the attack and health values of both sides, and we will destroy the units and discard the cards. Here, if we have cloak units, they will be able to use their ability. Then we will resolve the splash damage. And the last thing is that we will resolve all the retreats. After we have finished the execution phase, we will go to the last phase in the round, which is the regrouping phase. Here also we're going to have a sequence, and the first step is to destroy bases and transports. So here, for example, we have a fire bat of the Terran in the same area where we have a base of the Protoss. So the Protoss base will be destroyed. Also, if we have a transporter and on neither planet next to the normal navigation route, we don't have a base of that same faction, this transporter also will be destroyed. So for example, if this base would not exist, then in this part of the regrouping phase, this transporter would have been destroyed. The second step is that we need to lose the resource cards that we don't control their planet or their areas anymore. So here, if we have a planet like Helios, for example, if, for example, at this step, we're going to have an enemy unit on this specific area, then the Protoss would have this card, this card, because this is the one that correspond with that specific area, Two, where we have all the other resource cards of the planets on the table. If we had some workers on the card that we just put back in the pile, these workers are considered to be destroyed. Next, the players will gain resource cards. And again, we know that we need at least on a planet a base in order to take the resource cards. If the planet is completely empty besides your units, you will take all the corresponding resource cards. But if we have an enemy unit on the planet in a certain area, then you will receive all the resource cards besides the one that has an enemy unit in it. Then we will retrieve the different workers that harvested some resource for us in this round. Then we will gain conquest points. And as you saw, we have different planets uh, that sometimes have an indicator of conquest points, like we have over here or over there or even on Tarsonis. At this step, if we control one of these areas, like we can see on this planet with the Zerg right over here, we'll be able to push our faction marker one step forward on the conquest board for each conquest point that we have received. In this case, we have the Zerg gaining one conquest point. The next step will be to check if someone have one with a normal victory condition, and that means if one of the factions has reached 15 conquest points, if no, then we will check if one of the factions has achieved their special victory condition that we can find again on the player mat. Then we will play the event cards. So all the players in this round that have acquired one of these event cards will now be able to simultaneously, of course, look at these cards secretly. And then starting from the first player, each one, if they want, will be able to play one card. After an event card has been executed, it will be discarded. Of course, not all the event cards will be executed immediately. In this case, the player will put the event card next to their playing area. It's important to say that if we'll have a player resolving the end draws near card, it will not be discarded, but it will be placed in the common area play next to the board. This will be some sort of a warning because the next time that a player will resolve another card of the end draws near, the game will immediately finish and the player with the most conquest points has won the game. After that, each player will discard their combat cards that they have in their hand down to their limit. Usually it's going to be six cards, unless of course you're playing with a Terran, as we said, and then you will have a limit of eight cards. The last phase will be to take the first player token and move it one step clockwise. Every time a player will use a special order token, he will receive a certain bonus. First of all, we need to remember that a player may place a number of special order equal to the number of research and development modules he has built. So if, for example, the Protoss have built two of those research and development modules, they will be able to use up to two special order tokens. Let's start with the first one, that is the special build order. So when a player will use this special build order, he will receive the following bonus. 
First of all, his unit build limit will be increased by one. Also, the active player will receive a one resource discount of the regular cost of either a unit, base, transport, building, or a module. Pay attention that this will be only to one acquired object only. The second special order is the special mobilize order. When the active player will start a battle while using this special mobilize order, first of all, if he would like, he can draw two more combat cards when he needs to draw the cards before the combat. And that means that he will be able to draw up to five combat cards. In addition, he will add one to his final attack value in each skirmish of the battle. So here we have two skirmishes in this battle. And using this special order token, the active player will be able to add one to the final damage of each skirmish. And the last order that we have is the special research order. When a player will execute this special research order, he will need to choose one of the following. Either draw an additional event card, or if the player purchased a new technology to add to his combat deck, he can place one of these corresponding technology cards in his hand instead of shuffling it into his combat deck. So if, for example, a player has done a research and wanted to take this status field, he will be able to take one of these cards and put directly into his hand, and only the other one he will shuffle into his combat deck. Another function that we have with harvesting resources is force mining. First of all, this is something that we'll be able to do only with the resource cards and not with the permanent resources. So let's say, for example, that they have already two workers harvesting minerals from this card right over here. At this point, we'll be able to force mine this card, and that means that we can add one more worker to this card in order to receive one more mineral. When we're doing something like this, we will take this token right over here, and we'll put it on the corresponding area of that specific planet. So if just for the example, it was Tassadar that did it in Tarsonis, we will take this token and we'll put it right over here. The next time that we will force mine this area, we will flip this token right over here to the other side. And that signifies that all of the resources in this area have been completely depleted. So all of the workers that we had on this card will go to the unavailable worker pool right over here. And this card will be able to put back in the box because we will not be able to use it anymore until the end of the game.